Now, friends, as we get underway here today in the epistle to the Colossians, I should remind you, I think, first of all, that this is one of the prison epistles. You will recall that we said Paul wrote Ephesians in prison in Rome. He wrote Philippians there, and he wrote Colossians there. And we have yet to take up another very small epistle, a very personal one, and that's Philemon. And these four apparently were carried out of Rome by four messengers. It was about the year 62 A.D. Four men left Rome unobserved, and they were carrying very valuable documents. Tychicus was carrying the epistle to the Ephesians over to Ephesus, where he apparently was either the pastor or leader of the church. And Epaphroditus was carrying the epistle to the Philippians, for he was the pastor of the church there. And Epaphras was carrying the epistle to the Colossians, because he apparently the leader or the pastor of that church. And then Onesimus was carrying the epistle to Philemon, because that was his master, and he was returning to him. Now, these four epistles... They're bound together, actually, and in them you have the anatomy of Scripture. Now, those of you that have my little book on Ephesians, you know that we've attempted to put these epistles together and look at them in a very definite way. You have, I think, in the epistle to the Ephesians, actually the church, which is the body of Christ. And in the epistle to Colossians that we come to, the emphasis is upon Christ, the head of the church. And in Philippians, you see the church walking down here. That's Christian experience that you have. And then in the little epistle of Philemon, you see Christianity in action. You get right down to where the rubber meets the road, friend are where the sandals in that day touched the Roman road, and you see it being worked out in a pagan society. Now, these four documents have been called the anatomy of the church, if you please. I will rather agree with that. And actually, they belong together. I don't suppose that Brinks ever carried four more valuable documents than these were. Had you ever stopped to think that if we had in our hands today those four documents, as Paul wrote them, as they came from his hand, you could probably get any price that you want for them. And you would have the wealth of a king. Well, we measure it in other terms than the dollar sign. The spiritual value of them cannot be estimated in human terms at all. Now, I want to say by way of introduction several things concerning this place of Colossae. I have not been to Colossae. I've been in sight of it. I have seen it from a distance. That is, the ruins of it as it stands there in the gates of Phrygia. It actually is over in the same area where Laodicea is and Hierapolis is. Here was a great civilization and a great population were in that area. It was more or less the door, called the gates of Phrygia, it was the door to the Orient, to the east. And here indeed the east and the west met. And here's where the Roman Empire attempted to tame the East and to bring them under subjugation to themselves. Now, it was a great fortress city, the same as Laodicea, the same as Philadelphia, the same as Sardis, the same as Thyatira, and the same as Pergamum. These were great cities of defense against invasion from the East. But by the time You come to the period of Paul the Apostle, why the danger had been relieved because the Roman Empire was pretty much in charge of the world at that time. 
And so these people lapsed into a paganism and a gross immorality at that time. And the city of Colossae was typical of the great cities of that day. Now, as far as the record is concerned, Paul never visited that city. And when I was in that area, I could understand many things in the Scripture that I could not understand otherwise. Why didn't Paul visit it? Well, Paul came in to the north of Colossae. He did not apparently come in through the gates of Phrygia. He came in over at Sardis on the Roman road that is over there. And that apparently was the way that he went to Ephesus. Now, Paul never was in the city of Colossae, yet he's the founder of the church there. Now, this man Epaphras apparently was the leader and could have been the direct founder. But Paul founded this church very much like he founded the church in Rome. He touched multitudes of people in the Roman Empire who gravitated to Rome, and they formed the church. Now, Paul, well, he may have gone to Laodicea. I doubt that very seriously. But from Ephesus, there in the school of Tyrannus, he lectured for two years. In fact, he was in the city of Ephesus for three years. And you don't appreciate this until you go over there and see what a tremendous civilization was in that area. Actually, the culture of the Roman Empire was there. It was no longer in Greece. Greece had pretty much deteriorated, and the philosophy and the culture had deteriorated. But it was virile in what we call today Asia Minor, or Turkey, as it is specifically at the present time. So that in this area, Paul did the greatest work together with his co-helpers. There was with him, of course, John Mark and Barnabas for a time, and then he had with him Silas, and he had with him Timothy, and apparently some of the other apostles joined him. John became pastor there in Ephesus later on, and he's obviously buried there. Now, this was a great area, and it was a great area for heathenism, paganism, the mystery religions centered in that area. Now, there was already abroad that which was known as Gnosticism. And there was this sect in Colossae. This is the first heresy of the church. And there were many forms of Gnosticism. And in Colossae, there were the Essenes. And there were three points of identification of them. They had an exclusive spirit. They were the aristocrats in wisdom. They felt like, you know, that they were the people. They had knowledge, you know, in a jug, and they had the stopper in their hand. They felt like they had the monopoly of it. And as a result, why, you find that they were super-duper in knowledge, and they thought they knew more than, of course, any of the apostles. And Paul's going to give a warning about it over in the first chapter, verse 28. He says, speaking of Christ, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Jesus Christ. Now, perfection is not in a cult or that type of a thing, but actually in Christ Jesus. And if you have any wisdom, it's in him. Now, the second thing I should say concerning the Gnostics there, the Essenes, they held speculative tenets on creation, that God did not actually create the universe directly, but he created a creature who in turn created another creature, and that creature created another creature, and Christ was one of the creatures in that long series of creations. And that is what was known in pantheistic Greek philosophy as the Demiurge. You may or may not have heard of it. And then there was another identifying mark of this group. Their ethical practice was asceticism. They were influenced by Greek stoicism and also by unrestrained licentiousness, which came from Greek Epicureanism. 
and they were pantheistic in their thing. Now, actually, friends, Christianity today sails, I think, between a Scylla and a Charybdis, and that is there is always the danger, on one hand, of Christianity freezing into a form, into a ritual. And it has done that in many areas and in many churches. It's nothing in the world but a ritual and a form. And all you do is just go through that, and that's it. And then, on the other hand, the other extreme, there's always the danger. It will evaporate into a philosophy. And today you have the philosophy... Well, as one man said to me, he's a liberal, he says, what theory of inspiration do you hold? And I said to him, I don't hold a theory of inspiration. I hold that the Word of God says that it is a revelation of God. That's not a theory. Now, there are theories of inspiration. And that is the other danger. And there's a danger of it freezing into a form and evaporating into steam. And you find, on one hand, the ritualistic churches. On the other hand, you find liberalism today, and it's just become a philosophy with them. Now, actually, the Lord Jesus, you remember, made this statement. He said, I'm the water of life. Now, he didn't say, I'm the ice of life. Now, ice water is pretty nice, and a lot of people like a beautiful ritual. And if you've got something to go with the ritual, it's fine, provided it's Christ. But the ritual is ice, and we must remember he's the water a lot. And then when you heat water, you get steam, and he never said, I'm the steam of life. He is the water of life, and that is water at the temperature of life at neither freezing nor boiling, but it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that's to walk down the street where you live. And I hope it's not freezing, and I hope it's not boiling. <laughs> this is bringing Christ down to where we live. This is getting right down to the nitty-gritty. This is getting right down where the rubber meets the road, friends. And that's where we want it today and where we need it today. There's always the danger of adding something to Christ or subtracting something from Him. And the oldest heresy is always the newest heresy. Christianity is not a mathematical problem of adding or subtracting. Christianity is Christ. And Paul will say in this epistle, "...in Him dwelleth." all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In him dwelleth all the pleroma. You get all you need in Jesus Christ, by the way. Now, this is something I think that's very important for us to see. Now, let me give you a quotation from someone that has spoken on this epistle, Dr. Sandy. He says in the Ephesian epistle, the church is the primary object and the thought passes upward to Christ as the head of the church. In the Colossian epistle, Christ is the primary object, and the thought passes downward to the church as the body of Christ. And the dominating thought in this epistle is, Christ is all. <laughs> He's all I need. He is everything. Charles Wesley in his lovely hymn, Put it like this, Thou, O Christ, art all I want. More than all in Thee I find. How wonderful. And that's what this epistle is going to tell us, and it's a proper epistle to follow the Song of Solomon. And if we can learn, as Spurgeon put it, he says, Look on thine own nothingness and be humble. But look at Jesus, thy great representative, and be glad. It will save thee many pangs if thou wilt learn to think of thyself as being in him, accepted in the beloved, and find in him our all in all. A letter I read this dear lady right here in Pasadena, 80 years old. 
doesn't expect to live much longer, but she's now resting in his loving forgiveness. You can't find a better place to rest today, my friend, than in him. And when you find that, you won't need to go through a ritual. You won't need to do a lot of gyrations and genuflections. won't be necessary. And you won't need to discuss the theories of inspiration. You either believe the Bible is the Word of God or you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. Let's cut out this so-called intellectual approach that we have today. It's no good. I started out as a pastor like that, and I'll be honest with you. I had an elder that came to me, and he talked to me about it. He said, you know, we'd rather have a genuine Vernon McGee, as bad as that is, rather than an imitation, somebody else. You see, I was imitating somebody else. And we just don't need to do that. We need to be ourselves, and we need to get down off of our high horse. And remember, he's feeding sheep and not giraffes. This is a very wonderful epistle, by the way, that we're coming to. And I think probably I ought to get my foot in the door here, at least in this first study that we're having in it. And probably we ought to go over and look at the outline of the epistle. Now, this epistle divides itself as all of Paul's epistles can be divided. That which is the doctrinal section and that which is the practical section. Now, in the doctrinal section, you have the first two chapters. And we read in that section, Christ, the fullness, the pleroma of God, in Christ we are made full. Now, we'll see the divisions under that. Then in the practical section, we see Christ, the fullness of God, poured out in the life through the believers. And that's where we need to break the alabaster box of ointment in the world. You know, the world not only needs to see something today, but it needs to smell something. And I tell you, the pollution of this world is smelling very bad now. We need something of the fragrance and loveliness of Jesus Christ in the world that only the church is permitted to do it. So many of us need to break that alabaster box of ointment.